so hi, uh, Catherine Lamb. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to talk with you. You're in Berlin. I'm in Chicago. Uh, we're both in lockdown. <laughs> so, uh, and it's Christmas, just after Christmas. So hopefully we're feeling a bit of the holiday spirit as much as we can. <laughs> Um, and so with these interviews uh, that, that Nomi has been organizing, we want to talk a little bit about um, your work uh, generally, uh, your work as a musician and uh, your work as a thinker about music and, and a composer. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about your work with Aperiodic and how that has kind of uh, developed over the last few years. And uh, kind of lastly, sort of move into these questions of, uh, of what you're working on now and how your thinking has developed. So, so maybe we can start with just the, the immediate present and sort of how, how creativity has been impacted by our current conditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I guess over the past year, I've been uh, focusing in on well, kind of a one sort of larger work that kind of became two separated pieces, but obviously most of it was sort of in my own, uh, yeah, imagination because it not being around musicians that much. Though in Berlin, we did have a, a window where we could we could kind of start to meet again and rehearse in, in smaller configurations. Um, yeah, and that did generate, because I was working on this big brass piece and then reconfigured something for strings and realized it worked better with oh, strings. Wow. And, then, and then it became, that's why then it started to split into a couple of pieces that were, and then it just kept spiraling. But um, yeah, how has it been impacted? Just um, the nature of being a bit more separated from people, but then also at the same time, uh, there's been, I'm part of a, an ensemble here in Berlin that's starting to establish itself. It's just at the early stages. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's been actually an intense time for that ensemble because we had this uh, James Tenney uh, festival in October and it just so happened to fall in this window where we could still do it. And we kind of went for it, even though it's maybe a little crazy for the times. Um, but then, yeah, and, and also because of, because travel has been restricted and so many musicians have been put out of work, suddenly we had all these incredible musicians around that are just here, not wow. traveling, but actually yeah. here. And then all these people that are like, oh, I really want to work on Just Intonation because I have all this time suddenly. So yeah. <laughs> like getting these questions from friends and then suddenly there's, like more and more serious musicians working on rational intonation. And, and now this, this ensemble is actually growing, but it's a, a bit conceptual at the moment because we're not able to, you know, meet, but, mm -hmm. but it's kind of exciting in that oh, way. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, this is, yeah, I mean, as horrible as everything is, it's interesting to see how these conditions or sort of opportunities that will emerge from it. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting. Do you have a name for the ensemble yet? It's called Harmonic Space Orchestra. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Named after the tenny, yeah, term. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. That's really, really great, cool. So that's, that's really, that's super exciting and I'm glad your, your ideas are getting some traction around, around the community there. Um, but maybe let's go back in time a little bit and talk about, um, bef uh, well, I, don't, I wanted to say before you moved to Berlin, but I'm forgetting when you moved to Berlin. It was around 2013, 14. Okay. okay. Yeah. Great. So yeah, so back before you moved to Berlin and the kinds of musics you were you were writing, the kind of music you were writing, you know, around 2010 and 2011, which is um, the works that Aperiodic have featured, uh, the, the works that Aperiodic featured of yours kind of cluster around that time period. So I'm thinking of two lines together, which is from 2020, Periphery for two from 2011, The Field for Agnes, number one, also 2011, and then Line Shadow from 2010. 
So I'm kind of curious as to what you, what kind of that, that body of work and how you understand, understand it looking backwards from like 10 years, what, 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 what about those pieces sort of um, stands out to you in memory? Yeah, I think um, I was sort of transitioning around that time into new forms of notation and trying to, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what is, what is the best, what is, well, for, what is the clearest notation? And I am still not there yet, but <laughs> I keep trying different things. But um, around that time, I hadn't, um, I wasn't associating the, like for instance, Hemholtz Ellis, I wasn't integrating it uh, into the notation so much, or I was integrating a very um, uh, rough version of it, I guess, at some points. But just to kind of, the point was to, how, do, how can I just clarify these things from multiple directions? And so I guess line shadow is the graphic version. And there's a few pieces that are more like text scores and mm -hmm. ways that sort of guide the musician into the sound from that angle where, okay, we're not even gonna talk about frequencies. We're not even gonna talk about um, numbers. We're just going to just go purely into like our, our initial sound association and go from there. And then there's, okay, so field for Agnes, I started to, okay, this is trying to develop, okay, then what is the more conventional notation approach to this? Like it's how, how do you write this on a stave but still emulate the information in the right way? And then, um, yeah, like periphery for two, I was trying like in those kinds of pieces, um, there's also a, related to that piece, there's this piece of animal that's uh, for viola and voice. <laughs> and um, and it's it's trying to, okay, what if you just, just go directly to the numbers themselves? So you have a key at the beginning and or the frequencies are limited enough. So you can kind of, um, I mean, it, that only works if you have a limited number of frequencies, but maybe not. But um, in that time, I thought so. But um, uh, because it's often, yeah, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and then you just, okay, here's, for instance, like this sort of uh, condensed pentatonic okay. <laughs> uh, mode. And then, um, okay, so then you just, you associate, you start, I was wondering how can you start to associate the numbers as tones and just just go straight to that because and just wondering like because maybe you don't need anything else yeah. and i i think this is actually the most exciting for me but i it doesn't always work in my and depending from piece to piece i can't always do that i, ca I can use it in addition to more standard forms of notation or yeah but i or in addition to frequencies or something but just going directly to the numbers that suggest partial relationships. Yeah. Um, and that's a piece like periphery, right? If, am I thinking mm -hmm. correctly? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was actually, as I was looking at the three, at the pieces, I was, I was, I mean, because I know your music, you know, fairly well by this point in our, in our friendship, <laughs> um, I was struck at how clear periphery was, you know, as, as both what, I mean, activating a certain number of concerns that you, that I understand you having about, about listening and the primacy of listening and the importance of listening, as well as the importance of breathing, that these two, that there are ways in which that notation, um, I think just had a certain kind of directness and clarity to it, that once I, so like I was, you know, I was mentioning before, once I was sort of looking at it with a tuner and I was kind of messing around with the vocal part yesterday with my Strobosoft <laughs> and was like nice. trying to see like, how would this actually work? You know, it's like, oh, this works really well. <laughs> um, so there was a kind of clarity to it that I was really, um, I think surprised by mostly because A, I'm a singer and I am like phobic of like, you know, <laughs> uh, pr precision <laughs> and pitch precision, I guess. Um, but also, um, uh, well, mostly because I was a singer, and it, uh, and and I'm just not super experienced with thinking about that about those kinds of things. But there was just something really, um, I think, just like direct, and also uh, like listening to to both Ken and Rob perform it. It was just this kind of really 
just super interesting um, translation of these concerns that, that I don't know. I mean, I was thinking about these other pieces too. The graphic scores too were super interesting. And I'm sort of wondering, I mean, in terms of sonic result, this is, this is not meant to sort of be like, does, it's a question about sort of like how you, how the, how for you, what are the aural differences between, um, what the sort of resultant differences as a listener when you're listening to these pieces, like how do you understand the distinctions and resulting sound from these different kinds of notation between the sort of graphic, between uh, the numbers, and then between the sort of combination, like the field for Agnes has this kind of combina combina combined approach. So like in terms of sound, does that, how does that, how does that work for you? Yeah, I, mean, I think I would maybe agree with you in that I feel like what I was trying to get at with proof free for two sort of does the job <laughs> the most no the job whatever that means, but the, it, it, it does it it that you can access it more clearly as a musical experience mm -hmm. and I and I do hear that in the performance of it too and I, I actually really like um I like Ken and Rob's version of it really too because I like that it was originally meant for these two women's voices like good friends of mine and then it's so nice that they translated it to just fit the group. No. also important and I like the flexibility of that too because when you're if it's just numbers you're looking at you can also do that you can adjust mm -hmm. it yeah. which some of my pieces that are more frequency uh, attached to frequencies it's a little bit more difficult but yeah. um but the what was I going to say just that the I think that the result of and may, maybe the sense of um the sense of pacing and intuitiveness comes yeah. across the most with that, uh -huh. just because, okay, maybe because it's so clear. And whereas I feel like um, the field for Agnes, I think it's just whenever you read something on a stave or in that way or kind of laid out, you just automatically associate this this other history or this other yeah. past you know that you can't yeah. avoid and i mean i and i still i still write on staves mm -hmm. for a lot of pieces it's it's really hard to avoid that when you're when you're dealing with tonality you know yeah. um and musicians like to see that too often um but it yeah so it's just a navigate but i do hear there's a, a great difference somehow somehow periphery feels more freeing Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just maybe it's just because it's a different piece. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe that it's just the material is different. But um, and then line shadow, I kind of like how it it sort of works with whatever. It's that it's so open. It's it's it's. Um, I mean, I th I feel like it's one of the pieces that of mine that played a lot just because a lot of my pieces aren't so open <laughs> as, as I think as I think experimental musicians really want want it to be and so it's, it's hard yeah. because it's like I can't if you're if you're working with yeah scordatura or tunings and then you have things fixed then you're already starting to limit yourself so it doesn't it's not always congruent with the experimental tradition um but I, I like the um I like hearing how the musicians navigate a piece like Line Shadow because it's mm -hmm. it's just like it's it's really beautiful to me, and I, and I feel like in a way it's it's really it gives I have I give up something for it, it in a way it ends up not being oh, I don't know what the word be. Um, 
feels like a truly collective approach and there's something yeah. really sweet about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that really, I mean, for me, that really comes across in a periodic's performance. Is... This is one of these really interesting things. I mean, you brought up the idea of history and the, you know, the experiment, the experimental tradition and such. Um, and I'm sort of wondering about, you know, that that for me it felt that the musicians in Aperiodic sort of knew these other pieces and kind of knew your sound world. And so they knew kind of how to translate that onto the graphic score. Did have you had performances of that are just sort of like wildly variant like don't that or even like the first performance like before you became cat lamb you know <laughs> is there a way that that performance like had a very different kind of sound or i don't know what are your i mean i'm kind of curious about this idea of you know how we negotiate these open scores through our our understanding of what the sound world of the what the music should sound like right this is a huge problem with cage and sort of cage's understanding of his own music and I, and open notation, but there's yeah. also becomes this performance practice tradition too, or like, well, this needs to sound like Cat Lamb, but is it Cat in 2016 that we're projecting back onto 2010? Or you see what right, I mean? Right. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, about yeah. This, these are good questions. It's something I think a lot about too, because I also I struggle with this very concept because I feel like I want to be at a place where I can be open to any kind of aesthetic because I actually feel like aesthetics are very problematic in, in our world <laughs> and they create hierarchies, you know, and, um, and they emphasize difference and, uh, or they, are they, aesthetics often put us into places that sometimes can be damaging but at the same time, obviously I have my own aesthetics and obviously they're linked to certain traditions or histories or people that identify similarly with, or that there are, you know, resonations that occur that I can't avoid because it's just what I'm drawn to do. Um, so I also, I, I like the idea of, of being pushed <laughs> or challenged. And I like, uh, I would like to, um, experience my work being, okay, how, how, how much can I push it out to the edge of what is acceptable? I think this is an interesting question. And I also, I really, really love hearing different versions of, of things, like, even if they seem like, okay, they still fit in the aesthetic. They're always different or everyone always performs differently. But, um, Oh yeah, but the first performance of Line Shadow was uh, a New York group, and uh, or it was not like a, a established group. It was New York musicians that, that were put together for this project that someone had organized, and they had asked me to write a piece. Um, and it was really interesting because I was I was uh, new to New York, and people didn't, you know, know my work so much, and and. Uh, yeah, it was it was very different than a periodic switch. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Oh, that's really interesting. So 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 just to kind of kind of take it forward a little bit, maybe um, I want to talk a little bit more about the notational aspects because it seems like the field is maybe sort of the line that's gone forward the most in notation. Is that correct in the understanding? You mean like linearity or? Uh, or in or, terms of the, or more similar to what your notation is like now, do you feel like? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it's sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, the direction it's going, yeah. Yeah, and for pieces that you write for yourself, how do you, how do you notate it similarly or? <laughs> uh, yeah, just numbers is what, oh, cool. I mean, I just have a, a few that like, um, mm -hmm. for instance, there's this, 
piece in the Prisma Interius series. Mm -hmm. And there's nine pieces in that. And one of them I've deliberately kept just for like myself and Rebecca mm -hmm. and yeah. and Brian and just yeah. like close close friends. Deborah's joined me. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Is that number four? <laughs> or just, you know, just for, what's that? Oh, I was asking if it was, was it the one you did here in Chicago at, with Lampo? Yeah, that one, yeah. that one, number four, yeah. So, so it's, that one is just <laughs> frequencies and, and numbers. Yeah. And then we, we, it's more we have to talk together about, yeah. about how we approach it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that. I mean, you mentioned Rebecca Lane, who's been you know one of your collaborators for se several years now, I imagine. And uh, maybe, it's, I mean, talk a little, could you talk us through like what it's like to work closely with people and how that, how that sort of, um, these kinds of close collaborations have shaped what you've been doing kind of since these 2010, 2011 pieces? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's just such a joy to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> you know, having close collaborators is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I had it in a different way before that, but um, just, yeah, just differently. Um, and everyone's so different, they just add a different, um, I mean, I guess, okay, the particular, the particular um, attribute that Rebecca brings is just her extreme dedication that, I've never had that with my own, I mean, just in my experience of someone so dedicated to working on my music, it feels like such a yeah. luxury. <laughs> someone who spends, you know, as long as possible on something and still is working on it after they recorded it and then makes another recording and then make another one and then they're still working, they're still not satisfied and it's like <laughs> gonna be this endless thing. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think, and I mean, I think, I mean, that's been, I mean, how, I mean, you're at this really interesting point in your career where you're getting a lot of commissions, you're working with lots of different ensembles that you don't necessarily, you know, get to get to spend a lot of time with. And that was kind of the case with Aperiodic. Would you talk a little bit about sort of how you, how you got connected to the group and, and Nomi and your, your memories of that? Yeah, I mean, just, I guess through Nomi, because um, uh, she's such a great initiator um, and such a great presence in the in the scene, and not just in Chicago, but I just feel like um, just in the in the music contemporary music world, she's really great to have around. I feel like she's just since I've known her, she's been like, okay, let's get this going and this going and this going and just getting people together and, ma and matching people and trying, okay, I'm doing, I'm thinking about something along the lines of this, you know, trying to gather text scores. And then I remember at one point I was like, oh, I'm just at the end of writing text scores or just, but then it was, but, and she, but she was just like always wanting to be inclusive. So nice. Um, and so uh, it's, I'm I don't know when the first, when was the first, time that they played a piece. I'm really sad that I haven't been able to uh, work with them in the same space, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that hasn't happened yet. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, we were trying to make that happen when, when they did the, the last concert in Chicago mm -hmm. with the, the portrait concert. Yeah. But the timing didn't work out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how did you sort of? I mean, when you're sort of working in kind of long distance collaboration with that, I mean, there obviously has to be a lot of trust for the ensemble. But how, was there any kind of communication and back and forth around around preparing the pieces? Yeah, I think for a periodic, I mostly um, communicated a lot with Nomi because she and just to I can't remember. Um, yeah, just to relay, because I, I, I think she, she understood a lot about what, what was needed or required. And, and we just, I think, talk, uh, we just had a lot of back and forth. Um, yeah, I 
I don't know if there were some some recordings sent back. So now I'm not I'm not remembering, but I do, I knew it's like um, it it's always different from ensemble to ensemble how these things are approached, mm -hmm. um, in a really different way. Because I was just talking with the yarn wire folks, for instance. Right. In oh New yeah, York I and, remember. Yeah, with Carrie. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking, yeah, because well, that was a different situation because it was we were working on a new piece, mm -hmm. which is a, that's always such a different thing when. Um, yeah. But yeah, that felt, even though we never, because we never met in um, person until they later on when they came to uh -huh. Europe, but but in the process of working on the piece, it was always, but we did do a lot of back and forth recording, sharing kind of thing. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Good way to learn. yeah. So I guess maybe we can sort of moving forward a little bit, sort of what are, um, I mean, all of the, like we were talking about later, these pieces, I think really do kind of put this focus on the listener in a way, both the performer being a kind of listener in a very um, profound sense. And even, you know, this is something I've, that I've written about your music and that it just tends to let us hear more. I remember the first time, you know, when we were in the, in the Kunstraum when I first met you, a couple of years ago that there was this real sense of just having my you know ears really expanded and it was that it was not only you know it was certainly your it was certainly like just intonation or like you know having this kind of different you know um this different way of of relating tones together that i was not super familiar with but also the way that you were handling it so artistically and wonderfully um so I'm, maybe we could talk just a little bit about, you know, this problem of aesthetics, right, is, is something that does lend itself to hierarchies, lend itself to disqualifying certain kinds of music. Um, and, yet, and yet you can be fairly, you know, um, uh, enthusiastic about, about the certain kinds of aesthetics that you're, you're drawn to, which don't necessarily seem to be hierarchical, right? I think this focus that you put on the listener I think has has a certain kind of democratic sensibility to it, but I would want to maybe just open up that question of how you're thinking about this role of listening, like as as a kind of oh well maybe I'll just tell you what I think about it for a moment. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I, I mean obviously we're always comparing ourselves, or at least experimental music always has to deal with the legacy of John Cage for better and worse. And Cage is, I think. <laughs> You know, Cage has this really annoying statement of like composing is one thing, performing is another, and listening is another, right? So I'm paraphrasing that poorly. But I think what's so interesting about maybe what you're what you're offering to us is really this sense of listening is the primary position from which other these other positions or these other modes of of engaging with sound can, whether that's composition, whether that's performance, whether that's any number of ways. Um, that, that was kind of how I was understanding uh, your writing in the form of the spiral a little bit, but maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong or elaborate on sort of how you're understanding this, this role of the listener. Yeah, no, I feel like it's like the, it's, it's center, the, the listener is center to everything. Um, actually earlier in the year, I made a kind of uh, reduction. I guess these are all reductions, but um, I made a triangle uh, where uh, each point of the triangle was the composer, the interpreter, improviser, and then in the very middle was the listener. And that, um, and just trying, and then I started to kind of, you know, just for my own silliness, trying to, you know, place friends or, or people's music that I really like, like on this triangle and oh, kind wow. of, okay, are they more over here? Or are they here and they here? And I mean, these are, it's just one mapping. Of course, you can do all kinds of different mappings to that, but, but there is something about, um, ah, what, what I, okay, I always, I always go back to, excuse me, I always go back to bringing in the Drupad musician, <laughs> just because I feel like it's, I think the reason why I'm so still drawn to Drupad music is because it, to me, it's like, the most ideal music <laughs> and it's so old and classical <laughs> yeah. but it's like because it i think because it encompasses all those things mm -hmm. because the yeah the interpreter improviser composer and the listener like 
the Drupad musician is right there in the middle. Like they encapsulate yeah. all of those things yeah. all at once. And I just, it's like, how do you get to that point? <laughs> how do you get there? Um, and that's that's the thing that I, I struggle with the most with, especially notation. Um, because anytime you have, yeah, something on paper, it sort of destroys the beauty of the oral tradition or whatever. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I want, I want to write a piece. <laughs> or I want to. Not, I mean, I, yeah. It's it's like, well, how do you yeah. how do you do this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, but yeah, I think that the listener. I mean, that's all of those things, are all reflective of the listener, and um, yeah. No, you can't separate. Really, yeah, that's really fascinating, and it's just like something that. I don't know, I just like your music. And I think it actually is about, I mean, it is about just intonation. I mean, I'm thinking about other music that does what yours does to my ears. I was gonna say does to me, and I'll just say does to me, because I think that's a fair way to say it. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking about like Andre Miller and like the way that he sort of has this really kind of expansive world that he's creating through just intonation and, and such. Um, so I don't know, is there, do you think that there is something, I mean, I mean, what do you think about the role of just intonation in this? Is there something that, that it has, you know, kind of ontologically or, you know, fundamentally that, it, that makes itself available? I mean, this is maybe not the case with Drupad, right? But this is something that at least with the world, the world that you're working with and the sounds you're working with, I mean, do you, what kind of relationship do you see, do you hear, let's say, between this, uh, this kind of centrality of the listener and then, you know, the kind of, of harmonic space that you're opening up? Yeah, I mean, actually, I do think it, it's, it exists in Drupad music. Mm. You're probably sure. right. Because, I, mean, I don't know anything about Well, no, just, so. <laughs> but just because of that role of, of, of listening to tonality in this more expanded way, and I think maybe that's just the only the only thing it is, is is uh, and maybe any work in a way that like I mean I even you know sometimes when we perform Anton's music or something, but that anything where you're in a situation where you have to you have to experience each um, you're, well, I guess that maybe what you're what you're raising is that when you're dealing with rational intonation, it's it's very specifically pointing to these interactions that are happening, and that you can it's a kind of more expanded it's a specifically expanded approach to harmony that is more tangible, like acoustically tangible, that we can start to identify in a more complex way. But that's also very, um, I'm excited to read the article you just sent me, but it's like biological also like this, yeah. um, because it's, it's also part of our biological being and our acoustic awareness. It's, it's congruent with all of yeah. that, but at the same time, it, um, we can more easily identify and more easily expand into these complex spaces, but to start to hear them in a more multidimensional way rather than here's harmony. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's an A, there's a C there, whatever. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what was the other point that, yeah. I think, I think I, so that's, oh, just, just, just no, to say that. that sorry. That the, <laughs> no, 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 but. <laughs> that there's this, this one side of whatever you call it, just intonation, rational intonation mm -hmm. that is more expansive and then I also see the other side of it where uh, you get into a kind of vortex and it starts to become one shape. <laughs> and it's the thing that I, I start to also um, question in my, my own obsession with it because, mm -hmm. okay, it's, and the, the more I spend time in it, the more it gets locked into something it's funny, it becomes, it's, I mean, it's an expansive system, but it also has a very clear biological logic Yeah. that is the overtone series, you know, like you yeah. can't escape, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and you can't escape the, the simple nature of a one over two 
two over three, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it kind of reduces mm -hmm. everything, yeah. which is both, yeah. But I think you're getting, I mean, I mean, the idea of spit, like the, this, but you're dealing with this really interesting duality that really does, I think, I mean, not to pun, but really resonates with sort of how I hear your music. And when I'm in, in a space with it, I think being in the space live with your music is very important because it does, but it does these two things, right? It, as you're saying, it sort of creates this, this harmonic space that is not necessarily about a kind of vertical line that we're sort of moving along but is about this sort of elastic, um, I guess, envelope. <laughs> it's like a weird mixed metaphor sort of, but, um, but there's a way again that this, and this is maybe something that I was trying to get at too in my, in my little essay for, on you for Siemens is this sense of feeling a kind of expansiveness on across many levels, but that at the same time locks you into sort of feeling, you know, with it right that it sort of is it's something i'm feeling corporeally and it's and it is a real kind of resonance with the world <laughs> you know it's i don't want to get too metaphysical about it but it is something that i feel like that you do have this amazing duality right that where you're opening up the space but it is kind of you know making me aware of my listening as much as i am aware of my kind of I don't know, this is getting weird, but like connection to all things, <laughs> which is like not, this, which is right, you know, the music of the spheres, whatever, but it's, I mean, this is, this is um, I, I just think that it's, it's doing something really important and that you're sort of, you know, and that it, it does have a kind of, um, you know, even the sense of, you know, when you were describing your working with Elaine Radik, and sort of your understanding of her sort of using you like a synthesizer, right? That there is this way in which, you know, your, your resonance is, is integrated to all these kinds of, um, and it was, I guess, something I did experience when I heard you play her music too, is that kind of sensibility of expansiveness and spaciousness. That's not this kind of like, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about Morton Feldman. So there's this idea of sort of like verticality is like super important mm -hmm. to him. The, the vertical is this. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but the more I sort of look at other people and the way the vertical is conceptualized, right? People like, and philosophers like Merle Ponty or Gaston Bachelard, or even Hartmut Rosa I'm thinking about. He's a German sociologist mm -hmm. that I've been interested in developing this idea of resonance, a broad notion of resonance, which I think you might be, you might be interested in him. Yeah, what's his name again? Hartmut Rosa, R-O-S-A. Um, and his, his big book is called Resonance. Just, um, and I mean, it, it deals with sort of simplistic notions of music in some ways as, oftentimes is the case in critical theory, but it is quite, quite interesting, at least in terms of thinking about what he calls axes of resonance, right? So there's ways in which you, I, I could sort of understand what, what you're articulating in terms of your theoretical grounding as having these kinds of axes of resonance and harmonic space being, being a sort of multiply directed resonances that sort of, you know, crisscross in me as the listener, right? You, you still have this kind of cagey notion of individual perspectives or points of audition, but they're still kind of charged with this, with this fullness, I, I would say, or this fullness of resonance. So anyway, that was, yeah. that, was the, that was the, that was the most like, anyway, theoretical nice. I've been in a while, <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's, it's, I'm just, I feel like I'm glossing what you're, what you're giving me. So this is like what I'm, I'm trying to think with your concepts, which, which gives me a lot to think about. So. Huh. Yeah, it's great to hear you do Sorry. that. It's great. No, I like it. It's, nice. it's inspiring. Oh, yeah. likewise. I am already inspired by you. So it's a good, it's a good <laughs> so mutually, mutually inspiring. So I'll take it. So, well, we shouldn't probably yeah. go on too much longer, but I wanted to maybe just check in and sort of see going forward what are, I mean, you've mentioned the Harmonic Space Orchestra. You mentioned some other pieces you're working on. Is there anything, any other projects on the horizon or? big pieces you're working on or things that are um, getting rescheduled <laughs> from, from yeah a lot of rescheduling of things um but the one that sort of came out of the blue which is uh, unusual that I'm kind of excited to try to that's sort of maybe 
um, connects to what we were talking about earlier um, is that I, I'm writing this piece for this uh, really beautiful um, Corsican polyphonic male vocal sextet. <laughs> They've, oh my they've been gosh. together. They've been together yeah. since um, 1979. I mean, the wow. oldest members, the the oldest, yeah. like the, the 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 eldest, has been there mm -hmm. since 1979. And it's um, but yeah, so it's six male voices and um, and yeah, Corsican polyphony. But I and then I was talking with him, and I I was kind of like, well, how is this good? Because I like you're. What you do is so gorgeous and I just feel like how am I gonna I don't know I was just kind of asking him how they work and everything and he said that basically everything is um oral they don't they don't read off scores they don't they memorize everything and so I'm I'm really excited to try to approach things that way okay how yeah. can I make an oral score oh this is right up your alley holy cow yeah which is really great. fun. So how, so how can great. I just give them without, you know, yeah. no, no paper? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. So that'll be fun to try. To how did that out. happen? How did, the, what was the? Uh, well, it's actually through this uh, ensemble in Hamburg, um, Ensemble Resonance is what oh, they're called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so, so it's also with strings. So I don't, oh, I haven't great. decided yet if I will make their part also oral, which could be really fun. Yeah. But so they're, they're kind of coming together. So it's these six voices and eight strings. Um, yeah, it was just kind of thrown at, thrown at me out of nowhere. And I was just like, hey, I have to, I have to do this because it's it'll be fun to yeah. try to figure out. Yeah. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. That sounds totally amazing. Cool. Well, I think we will probably leave it there, stop the recording, um, but oh. thanks for talking. It's great to hear about your work and how it's intersected with a periodic and how what they've done sort of, you know, illustrates some of these great ideas that you're having and great sounds you're making. So really yeah, thanks for thanks talking. Yeah, so thanks so much. Yeah.